For the last five years, I've been pursuing my doctorate in counseling psychology. My dissertation was focused on helping teachers feel less stressed. I designed a group intervention program where I'd go into teachers' schools and I'd spend time with them running through different mindfulness practices. We talk about how to cope with stress, how to breathe in and out, and how to prioritize self-care. Across the last five years, I've run these groups in close to 15 schools. And my hope in doing all of this was to help teachers better cope with the very stressful nature of their profession. So there's one day amidst all my research that really stands out to me. It was a regular day, but it's kind of changed the way I see everything. So I just want to tell you about it. It was a October afternoon. And as some of you now know, being a graduate student often means running from one place to the next. And that's exactly what I was doing that day. I had just finished up a session with a client and I was driving across town to make it to the school where I was leading that day's teacher group. I remember being stuck in so much traffic. I wanted to bang my head against the steering wheel, but I didn't. I made it. I found a parking spot. And I remember just piling on top of me all the things I needed that day. So name tags, pens, worksheets, packets, and snacks. And I remember juggling this pile of stuff with me and weaving through a bustling elementary school hallway where kids were laughing and screaming everywhere. And teachers were sitting hunched over, exhausted, holding giant megaphones in their hands, trying to operate that day's carpooling procedure. So despite this chaos, I finally found the classroom where I was leading that day's group. It was me and six teachers. We were sitting around in a circle in these small navy blue plastic chairs. And we were surrounded by all the things you'd expect to be surrounded by in an elementary school classroom. So there were star charts on the walls, crayons scattered around, and kids drawings plastered everywhere. So as the group started, I started handing out the materials and delving into my typical spiel about mindfulness, about the power of focusing in on the present moment without any sort of judgment. At this point, I had given this introduction to mindfulness so many times, and I remember midway through doing it, just kind of mentally pausing, like, you know when your mouth is moving, but your mind is floating somewhere else? Well, that's what was happening to me in this moment. And where my mind floated to was towards an acute awareness of the immense exhaustion just exuding from these teachers. I, I mean, these teachers sitting across from me were so clearly tired and burnt out after a long school day. What was interesting about this group of teachers is that they weren't a uniquely stressed bunch. In fact, they really epitomized the plight of most educators within this country. They were being overworked, undervalued, and in my opinion, underpaid. They were working inside of an old school building infested with mold. They were trying to make ends meet despite missing basic materials for their students like pencils and textbooks. And they barely had time for lunch or any sort of break. I mean, they would have to eat their lunch in motion moving from one room to the next in the middle of the day. So as I was sitting with these six educators telling them about how mindfulness was gonna save them from stress, it hit me. These teachers, I could give them all of the tools, all of the mindfulness tools in the world, and they would still be haunted by stress and its multitude of health implications. These teachers weren't stressed because they weren't mindful enough or they weren't coping well enough. These teachers were stressed because they were operating inside of an educational system that was failing to prioritize them. I remember that day, the group closing out and walking out to the parking lot and just thinking to myself, just asking myself, as a mental health professional, how am I really helping people if it's not necessarily individual people that need to change, but the systems around them that need to shift? Am I really being helpful if I'm not changing these systems, but I'm just giving people tools to cope with and even succumb to these broken systems that are failing them? So these questions became burned into my mind. I could not stop thinking about them, not just in the context of teachers, but with my individual therapy clients as well. Because with my therapy clients, it didn't feel that different. They'd come into my office, they'd sit with me for 50 minutes a week, we talk coping skills, strategies, psychological practices, but then they would step back out 
into environments where they didn't feel supported, into environments where maybe they were experiencing bullying at school or persistent racial trauma, or maybe they were being pitted against a coworker in a toxic workspace. It was at this point in my education, in my career, where it became crystal clear to me. It's not just my clients that need to change, that need to do the work. It's the systems, the environments around them that need to shift. Just like a plant needs nutrient-dense soil to grow, individuals need healthy environments to flourish. Today, we have two dominant mental health models, psychotherapy and psychiatry. You're feeling sad, unmotivated, unable to get out of bed. Well, then maybe you want to go see a therapist, someone you can talk to once a week. If you're experiencing panic attacks, swirling racing thoughts, a palpitating heart, well, then maybe you'll get referred to see a psychiatrist, someone who can prescribe you medication to help mitigate these symptoms. These models in so many ways are amazing and effective. I mean, I've seen them work time and time again. However, I believe that they are just not enough. See, the thing about these models is that they're so focused on guiding the individual towards change, which is really important. But what these models are less focused on is transforming our environments and our systems into spaces that actively promote and sustain our collective mental health needs. This is incredibly important too. I want to take a second and just kind of zoom out, step back, and examine the mental health landscape all of us are living inside of today. And I want to do this because I want to show you why I don't think these models are enough for us. Today, mental health rates are skyrocketing, which is understandable. We're living inside of a global pandemic. Just as an example, this time last year, pre-COVID, one in 12 Americans were reporting symptoms of an anxiety disorder. Today, the number is one in three. The Kaiser Family Foundation put out a survey last month. What they found is that 53% of Americans right now, that is over half of us, are experiencing mental health issues. So the numbers don't look good right now, right? But it makes sense. I mean, we're living inside of a pandemic. The thing is, what's so mind-blowing to me is that even before COVID existed, we were facing a global mental health crisis. The numbers didn't look good to begin with. I'll give you some examples just in the US alone. Before COVID, one in five Americans reported feeling lonely or isolated. From 2008 to 2016, rates of hopelessness and anxiety shot up 71% among young adults. Before COVID, rates of suicide were at the highest they had been since World War II. Before COVID, 130 people were dying per day of opioid use. I could go on and on with numbers and stats like this, but the point in why I'm saying this is because something is not right. We're missing an essential piece of the puzzle. If we are in this bad of a shape when it comes to our collective mental health, then it's pretty undeniable that our current models are falling short on us in one way or another. And so I'm here to tell you this. I believe that it is time for us to develop new dominant mental health models, models that are innovative, models that are preventive, models that supplement and bolster what already exists. I believe that these new models need to center around one primary purpose. The onus of mental health care cannot just fall onto individuals. It must fall just as much, if not more so, onto our existing social environment. Now, at this point in this TED Talk, I wish that I could tell you I've invented a shiny new model of mental health that's going to save us all. I haven't figured that out. And to be honest, I don't think one person can figure this out. I think this is a collective, multidisciplinary effort that's already started. And my hope is that with time, it grows stronger and more ubiquitous. So having said all this, what I've done, what I've made my life purpose, my mission, has been to talk to you as many people as I can all over the world about what these new models could look like, what we could be doing better. I've had over the last year some incredible conversations with some amazing people, and I wish so much I could stand up here today and tell you about all of them. But I don't have that kind of time. So for the sake of time, I want to dial in on two of the individuals I had the opportunity to speak with. 
We'll start with Lorenzo Lewis from Little Rock, Arkansas. Lorenzo and I had the opportunity to speak on the phone a few times before and after the emergence of COVID in the U.S., and he was able to tell me about his grassroots movement, the Confess Project. The mission of the Confess Project is to transform mental health into a more accessible medium for men of color. Lorenzo and his team at the Confess Project developed something called the Barber Coalition, where they trained barbers in 14 cities across America in fundamental peer counseling skills like empathy, validation, non-judgment, challenging negative self-talk. See, Lorenzo did this because he believes that barbers can serve an essential role as mental health gatekeepers. He's even teamed up with researchers at Harvard to prove the significance of barbers in the realm of mental health. Lorenzo was inspired to create the Barber Coalition after he himself grew up spending time in his aunt's salon in Little Rock. He told me about how he would go in each day and observe the incredible interpersonal dynamics emerge in this community-oriented space. Like salons, barber shops are familiar spaces. They're spaces where formative relationships form, where many men can feel comfortable enough to open up about their life experiences. Lorenzo explained that a lot of men spend years, sometimes decades, sitting in their barber's chair. And over time, they grow to trust them, not just to hold a sharp razor to their heads, but to listen to the intricate and intimate stories of their lives. Lorenz and I discussed that because men of color in this country experience repeated systematic oppression, it can be hard to trust a therapist who may seem representative of an institution that has historically discriminated against them. And so that's why Lorenzo wanted to bring mental health into the barbershop space. He wanted to bring mental health into a space that already felt familiar, where individuals already felt safe, already felt seen, and already felt heard. Another individual I spoke with was Ayako Shimizu from Tokyo, Japan. Ayako's interests lie in the intersection between gaming and mental health. Her and I also had the opportunity to speak a couple times before and after COVID. And she was able to tell me about how she became interested in this very unique niche. When Ayako was attending university, she witnessed one of her closest friends descend into a depressive episode. It was so hard for her to watch this because her friend didn't have the opportunity to reach out for help in the community. Yako explained that at one point her friend reached out to a school counselor, but she was met with invalidation, with rejection. It was so hard to watch this because Ayaka's friend eventually had to drop out of school, despite the fact that she was bright and super hardworking. Ayako explained to me that what she saw happen to her friend wasn't an isolated incident. She'd seen it happen to multiple peers. Ayako told me that in Japan, it still remains stigmatized to reach out for mental health services. And so that's why she wanted to create video games with embedded mental health interventions. By doing so, she deemed it possible to transform mental health into something less stigmatizing, more accessible, and entertaining. So Ayako has developed a couple games, and most recently, she developed a game where players get to live and work in a house filled with characters that possess diverse identities, experiences, struggles, and backgrounds. What is so cool about this game is that it's not just a regular video game. It is a mechanism for developing self-awareness and interpersonal skills. Essentially, Ayako has created gamified and therefore a more accessible version of social emotional learning. And this is, in my opinion, incredible. Ayako and Lorenzo have both done something spectacular. They've transformed familiar spaces, a barbershop, a video game landscape, into spaces that actively promote mental health. They've shown us that mental health does not need to remain confined within the walls of a therapist's office or a counseling center, a residential treatment facility, a hospital. Mental health can be creatively and innovatively infused into the multiple environments we each interact with day by day. To end today, I just wanna ask you a few questions. What spaces in your life could you see benefiting from a shift like this? Maybe it's the gym you work out at, the school you attend, your workplace. Maybe it's the stories you read, media you interact with. Maybe it's even your own home. What do you think your community needs? 
Better yet, what do you think you can contribute to this sort of collective mental health shift? What I know is that to elicit this sort of shift, it can't just fall on me and my fellow mental health providers. This is an effort that requires all of us. We are all in this together. And so I end today with one final question for you. Are you ready to join me in the shift? I hope so. Thank you.